This is how Swansea Town Centre looked before the outbreak of the Second World War. St Mary's Church can be seen in the centre of the picture, but this all changed when the German Air Force, whose name was the Luftwaffe, was to launch an attack on Swansea. Yes, well, there was a revolution of changes in Swansea. First of all, all businesses had their windows sealed with adhesive tape. And windows then were filled with sandbags. There was a, a tremendous amount of concern with housewives about the impending rationing. And so there was a tremendous demand for corned beef and various other tin goods to stack up for the, what they anticipated would be a long siege with rationing. So grocery shops and everybody had queues with house by spending every penny they could to build up their reserves of food. Then again, places of uh, entertainment, like cinemas, had um, special announcers in there so that when uh, the bombing commenced, the film would be shut, stopped, and the uh, usherette or whoever, the manager, would get on the theater, would anybody who wish to go home, please leave now. The air warning alert has gone, but if you are going, please leave in an orderly manner, and you will be informed when the all clear comes. And then lots of people would make their way home because they were frightened, and good reason as well. But then at the end of the, uh, the period of danger, the all clear would sound, and again the manager or usher would go to say, I'm pleased to inform you now that the all clear has gone. You can relax in your seats. It was and the, incredibly, because of the lack of hygiene in that period, a man used to walk around the cinema with a spray, spraying over the, or the audience to kill germs because the hygiene had gone right down. Soap was rationed and there were lots of diseases like impetigo and various other uh, diseases associated with dirtiness. So that I always remember this woman walking around and spraying us all with these antiseptic gases, you know. The first indication that there was a, a great need for, for action to be taken was when there was a list made of children who were to be evacuated. My friend Hayden, Hayden Evans, who lived in uh, Penawern Terrace near me, was one of many who were allocated accommodation in country areas. So Hayden, with uh, two brothers named Grove, whose father was a policeman actually, were evacuated to a little village outside Kamali, and in a farmer's there, they were made welcome for the entire period, including the Blitz, because the government were concerned that young people were being killed, and so rather than to allow that to happen, they, they evacuated them and allocated them in private houses. I was not evacuated by the government because my father worked in the steelworks in Ponta Dawe, and therefore it is obvious he was commuting back and forth to Lando. So he got us all into the James bus and took us to Ponte Dawe and found us accommodation with his mother, my grandmother, known as Mamgi, in Core Road. So we went and lived with my Mamgi whilst the Blitz was on in Swansea, that, well, that was three nights. And from the back garden where my grandmother kept a pig and poultry, and grew all the vegetables, you could see Swansea was a mass of flames. The whole area around Swansea, the sky was full of, of light with the explosions that went with it, and there were hundreds and hundreds of fires which had been started by the incendiary bombs. Nearly all the centre of Swansea town was destroyed. There are lots of photographs now showing the destruction. It was immense. It in fact extended from Castle Street down to where the Plaza Cinema was. It was completely flattened, and in fact it had destroyed so much that Goat Street, which was below the level of Castle Street, had a bridge built by the army engineers but to take pedestrians from Castle Street down into Goat Street. But the only buildings standing still in Castle Street were the shelves of buildings on the, on the east side of Castle Street, which had now been rebuilt, of course. So St. Mary's Church was, was greatly uh, steeped in history, of course. This is about the third or the fourth church to be built on that particular site. And opposite, there's a little street called Little Wine Street, in which there's a pub, the Cross Keys, 
which is one of the oldest pubs in Wales, but it was a hospice initially. Um, people without a penny to their name, completely poor, were kept allowed to stop in the hospice, and then they were taken to the church to worship St. Mary's Church. Well, St. Mary's Church was very elaborate, wonderfully built, and deco inside was breathtaking. Sadly, the Germans didn't discriminate between churches and the industry, and it is bombed, and the damage was immense. The flames could be seen from Landor, alongside of David and Ben Evans, and the, the only structure left were the walls when the flames had put out. The fire brigade, you see, you must remember, they were very much short supplying water. There, there was a civilian fire service, partly uh, enlisted policemen were in it, and they built temporarily emergency water tanks around Swansea to supply water because they, there was so much demand, the demand exceeded the supply. So very often the fire service had to allow a building to burn out if there was no lives in jeopardy because the water was needed far more to save people's lives. So you had painted on these tanks the emergency water, EMS, EWS, uh, where the, the fire brigade go and put their pumps in there, they had a filter at the end of it and used water from these emergency water supplies. There was a very large one, I remember, opposite New Sala Chapel in Lando, in Pentrichon Road. And in the warm hot summer days, we used to go swimming in there. Because you must remember, the bars as well were shut, you see, the Swansea Bar Municipal Bar in St. Helens Road, by the Bayview, that was shut. So we used to swim in the emergency water tanks and in the canal, and in the river. It's a pretty rude style of life in those days. But a happy day, believe it or not. Despite the dangers and the carnage, they were very happy days. Because, you know, danger and stress brings people together. I well remember the story of a man who lived and he, in a, a residential area, and he had a big privet hedge between his garden and the next door neighbour. But they couldn't stand the neighbour. They didn't like him at all. They caught up and argued. The police were called. So along came the war. So they both men cut a, an alleyway between the in this fence, and they were living together in shelters and helping each other. And the war finished, and they went back to quarrel again. So that brings out people's attitude isn't it, towards each other, and danger brings people together. Well, now the market was, in fact, uh, and is still a, a national treasure, of course regarded one of the finest markets in the country. Swansea Market was no exception. It is built in Victoria times. And in fact, the original market had been under the walls of the castle, where farmers brought in their goods and sold them there. But the Swansea Market in the 1930s was a busy and very prosperous area. Then, sadly, it is bombed and gutted completely. So the local authorities had a temporary market in Wassel Square, but they operated on the street Temporarily, so, but we did have the message, the sad news that the only civilians had been killed up in Tyler Crescent. We were extremely upset by it because we, several of us, had relatives living on the hill. And in fact, my father-in-law was involved with the building of Town Hill and May Hill. He was enlisted as an unemployed man to work on, in labouring up on the hill there. There was terrible calling, but everyone gathered together and, uh, ironically, they made friends with people they'd never spoken to before, you know. But generally, it moulded people together. And of course, you had the organisation like the Home Guard, where local defence service it was, the LDV initially. And although it was dangerous and uh, fatal to so many people, in a sense, it was a rich period because, it, as they say, it galvanised determination to fight through and defeat the evil forces which are threatening our society. In order to keep uh, public morale up, the government decided to be a good idea if Winston Churchill and the Queen and King at the time, King George and his wife Elizabeth, uh, they, they were around the country to speak to the citizens and the dignitaries and uh, add a bit of um, zest into them, the downtrodden population. And the King and Queen arrived in Swansea in a special carriage at High Street Station. Now, they were taken round a very bomb-damaged Swansea, but one of the places that they were taken to was the Guildhall. And uh, my mother-in-law, 
Mrs. Nellie Phillips, was in fact involved with the civil defence. And she was so proud of it, she had a stirrup pump in the front room of her house in West Cro in Bryn Mill. But this particular day, she was asked with uh, several of her friends to uh, put on full uniform and to assemble opposite the Brangwyn Hall, on the roadway. And so along came the Queen and the King, together with the Lord Mayor and the uh, Lord uh, Alain Coth, who was the clerk of the court. Uh, and uh, I've got a photograph of my dear mother-in-law looking so proud the Queen is smiling at her, and my mother-in-law is smiling even bigger. She was so proud to be there, within reach of the, Her Royal Highness, the Queen of Britannia. Well, Churchill, yes, was it included a visit to the Bush Hotel in High Street. And there's a story, of course, which is absolutely true. The man who was driving Churchill around was a policeman named Trollope. He eventually became an inspector but he was under a police driver, and whilst they were in the proximity of the Bush Hotel, Churchill, who inevitably had a cigar in his mouth, handed a partly smoked cigar to Trollope, PC Trollope, and said, hold this and take care of this for me while I do something here. So Trollope was left holding the cigar, partly smoked, and the Churchill never recovered it, and for years afterwards, Mr. Trollope, Inspector Trollope, kept that cigar still in a box and proudly showed it around to everybody.